Good evening, everyone. Welcome to New York Buddha Dharma and the New Year. At least the new year according to the Christian calendar. We have the new year according to the Buddhist calendar coming up. February 25th, I think. Losar. So, the subject um, for this evening is taken from um, the Profound Treasury of the Ocean of Dharma, Volume 1, Chapter 3. And um, these are talks that Chagam Trungpa Rinpoche gave. Uh, he gave every year for 13 years, actually with one year off. So it took place over 14 years from 1983, excuse me, 1973 to 1987, uh, 13 years. And um, I think he did it in 87 or was it 86 the last year? But there was one year when he didn't. Huh? 86 was the last year. That makes sense because it was, he did it 13 times. And uh, he would take students away for three months and give talks, uh, and these talks were divided into, uh, on the one hand, what's called sutrayana. These are the talks leading up to the vajrayana, and then he would switch into the vajrayana talks. And those, the transcripts of those talks, um, of the sutrayana talks, the uh, non-tantric talks, were available, have been available all these years uh, for purchase. But the vajrayana talks were not available. They were kept secret until recently, uh, because in his will he specified, was it in his will, or he just specified that um, after a period of time the Vajrayana talks would, could be made public. And so they've all been digested uh, into three volumes, um, and these are called, these three volumes are called The Profound Treasury of the Ocean of Dharma, volumes one, two, and three, and it's kind of a pun, the um, name of this because Chögyam Trungpa's name, the name Chögyam, literally means Ocean of Dharma in Tibetan. So it's the profound treasury of the Ocean of Dharma, of his teachings. <laughs> and um, this chapter three is really terrific. I really recommend it. Um, it's really beautiful, very profound. And uh, I was shocked. It's the chapter three, I mean, you're barely into the whole thing. You know, these are these things take up this much space on a bookshelf, and you're into about this much of it with chapter three. And it's really worth it. So he starts out by talking about the fact that he's talking about the Hinayana path. See, the Hinayana, yana means vehicle. And there are three main vehicles in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. The Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. The Hinayana literally means the lesser vehicle. But Trungpa Rinpoche preferred to call it the foundational vehicle because it's not really inferior. It's just where you start. And the Mahayana is the great vehicle. And the Vajrayana, uh, which is all about Tantra, um, is the adamantine or indestructible vehicle. And that's the last and the most advanced teachings. So... Um, he starts out by talking about the fact that he's, what he's describing here is the Hinayana and one of its main characteristics is the main characteristic of Buddhism altogether which is that it's non-theistic now it's not atheistic but it's non-theistic and here's the difference um, Buddhism recommends that you have no beliefs including that very one. You don't believe in no beliefs. Just put them aside. And really it's about the examination and discovery of our experience seen beyond preconception and uh, false beliefs, you might say. So if we were atheistic, 
that would involve another belief, the belief that God does not exist. And Buddhism throws that out too, all of them. It's non-theistic, it's just not concerned with theism. And it regards theism as the look, uh, as the search, you might say, or the attempt to find an external reference point, an external judge, protector, um, to some a help, somebody who's going to help us out there. And what Buddhism says is, don't even bother looking. It's not there. And don't believe in that either, by the way. So it's non-theistic. It's really about the examination and the understanding of one's experience as it arrives, arises right now, in this present moment. At the same time, though, when we you know, affirm the idea of non-theism, there's still magic in the world. Um, and really, this magic is discoverable when we give up beliefs and we begin to see and perceive the world uh, stripped, which is kind of the practice that we were just doing. Every time we come back into the present moment, away from our thoughts, you know, let our thoughts go, and we come back to that bare awareness of the present moment, naked, there is the possibility of encountering the magic of this world, the way it arises now. Because really, the world is magical. All of this arising, where did it come from? It has no rhyme or reason, no logic. Where is it going? We live in the middle of an infinite universe. We feel that we're going someplace, you know. I'm going from Fulton to Gold Street, you know. Um, I'm going from New York to San Francisco as though we had a beginning and an end. And we're in the middle of this infinite universe in infinite time. We're going nowhere. <laughs> it's like, it's all this sea of, of, of endless, endless space. But we all think, oh, I've got to get from here to there. You know, I've got to improve myself. I've got to get better. I've got to become a good, better person. And then pretty soon, we're dying. So he talks out, starts out by talking about this, um, the non-theism of Buddhism, the no-belief aspect of Buddhism, uh, that Buddhism is a religion which really recommends you don't believe in anything. There was a famous second century Buddhist named Nagarjuna. He was an Indian. And um, sometimes he's called the second Buddha. And he said, put away all beliefs. They were called drishti in Sanskrit. And uh, they can be translated as views or interpretations or beliefs about reality. He said, put away all of them, including that one, he said. And he said, those who cling to that as a belief, the belief in no beliefs, those, the Buddhas, the Jinas, the victors, he called them, pronounce incurable. Then you're stuck believing in something. Yeah, belief is just, it's the uh, uh, thing of sort of children. You know, remember that thing from the Bible? When I was a child, I spake as a child. And then you put away childish things. And that's what Nagarjuna recommended. So in Buddhism, and then he talks about the three types of learning, but I'm going to pass over that um, because um, I'm more interested tonight in discussing uh, what he talked about as the four marks of existence. This is a famous, one of the hallmark teachings of Buddhism. Probably the, the two most famous foundational teachings of Buddhism are the Four Noble Truths and the Four or Three or Four, depending on who you're listening to, Marks of Existence. And these are the things that characterize our being. Um, the first of these is impermanence, that everything is impermanent. Suzuki Roshi was a great friend of Trungpa Rinpoche's, and he was the master of the Zen Center in San Francisco. And some of his students put together a biography of Roshi called Crooked Cucumber. Evidently, that's what his name meant in Japanese, Crooked Cucumber. 
And um, in the very beginning of it, uh, the person, the compiler, the author, David Chadwick, if the introduction describes sitting with Roshi and some other students, and he asked Roshi, almost fatuously, didn't really expect an answer, uh, if he would sum up Buddhism in just a few words, all of the essence of Buddhism. And he didn't expect an answer, and Roshi looked at him and said, everything changes. This is like the core of Buddhism, that absolutely everything changes. And it's changing in two ways. One is that we are growing, uh, for instance, imperceptibly older on each one of us. You know, these chairs are wearing out, but you can't quite see it. But you know that they are. You know, cars are wearing out and turning into junk. Um, The weather changes. That's an easier one to see. Uh, The sun rises and sets. The moon rises and sets too. But, and then we get older, we get stronger from when we were children, then we get weaker as we age and approach death. All kinds of things happen. Uh, Men, some of us lose our hair. Uh, We all get wrinkles uh, and our skin and our flesh begins to sag. Everything wears out. Things that are born die. That's one meaning of the impermanence. The other meaning of impermanence is that in this present moment, right now, nothing stays the same for even an instant. Everything is arising and passing away as though we're in a 3D movie. You turn your head and everything changes. These sounds come out of my mouth and they just disappear into the space. Our awareness of the world is changing moment by moment. The Hinayana teaching is more concerned with the first uh, meaning of impermanence because we would like to live forever, each one of us. And it seems as though we will, especially when we're younger. You just can't see the aging taking place until suddenly you turn around and you're 73 years old and you say, how did that happen? <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> it just went like like that. It's just a memory. You know, all those years that passed. But at the time, they felt like time was just barely moving. You know, like it was never going to happen. But it does. The second mark is the mark of suffering. And suffering is really tied up very much with the first mark, impermanence. Because the ultimate form of suffering, and really what suffering boils down to, is that we want to hold on to things. We want to create and freeze a version of our lives. We, if we want to get rich, we want to be rich forever. If we want to be beautiful, we want to be beautiful forever. And we can't. Things change, dissolve underneath us. Um, I wonder, hold on a second. I just want to read something to you. See if I can find it. Ecclesiastes 9.11. No, it's not going to do it for me. Maybe... Mm-hmm. Can you get it? Faster than me? Huh? What? No. Close. 
uh, I was reading, of all things, um, here we go, maybe. That's it. Re read it. Huh? Ecclesiastes 9.11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Beautiful. It's really beautiful. This is so Buddhist. <laughs> but time and chance happeneth to them all. It happens to all of us. The race is not to the swift, nor bread to the wise, nor riches, or whatever it is, to the race to the strong. But time and chance happeneth to them all. We all want to hold on to things so much as though we could grasp them in our hands, our youth, our loves, our happiness for that moment. And it slips through our fingers like water. And that is the real meaning of suffering from the Buddhist point of view. That we try to freeze things. We have, we, we, we imagine a happier way to be. And that imagining is like a frozen picture. It's like we drew a picture, you know, in, with a pencil or with paint. And it's, it's, it's rigid. And we say, that's what I want to become. You know, but if we ever do arrive there, as we are arriving, it's changing and it's morphing into something else and passing away. And this is the story of our lives, constantly pursuing a frozen picture of happiness. And in the meanwhile, our lives are passing like sands through an hourglass. And so it's that constant attempt to make permanent what can't be made permanent, that really is the basis of our suffering. He says, this is Trimble Rinpoche speaking, he says, so pain is based on the expectation that things will last continuously. Although the truth is that the rug could be pulled out from under your feet at any moment. We constantly, we are constantly trying to create happiness but it is continually dissolving. We try to make something out of our existence all the time. This trying to put things together is painful. And really, we see what the alternative is, is that practice that we did together of constantly coming back and just resting effortlessly in the present moment in which everything is changing rapidly. You know, as your gaze shifts, as the sounds come and go, as your knee starts to hurt, whatever it might be. And then the th third mark is egolessness. And this perhaps is the most difficult and it's also the most key of the three marks, of three of the four marks. Because what it refers to is that what we take to be an I and an other, that thing out there, that cushion, that person, those constant others out there that are relating to me, are just fictions. They are things that we create mentally. But in reality, all there ever is is this constant streaming that we're in the middle of, streaming of experience. But when we begin to understand the truth of egolessness and to give up that n belief in I, I, then the world really changes. He says, this means that there is nothing to hang on to from the point of view of self. Nobody can be saved because nobody's home. Egoless means, egolessness means that the situation that we're in right now is already perfectly clear. All you have to do, <laughs> you have to do, one has to do, is to stop trying 
to make it into something. Stop trying to get somewhere. Stop trying to be right. Stop trying to be holy or insightful or anything. And you just be completely ordinary here in the present moment. And then one might begin to live according to egolessness. And he says, when you begin to live that way, experiences that happen to us are no longer extraordinary. And things that exist within us are no longer serious. Although this mark qualifies the previous statement on suffering in that there is no substance to suffering at all, because there's no one who suffers. See, the whole thing of suffering very much depends on a big, big, big belief in a big, big me, I. It's all about me and my suffering. Everything that is saying that all dharmas are egoless, saying that everything is egoless, means that everything we handle, feel, perceive, everything we do has no receiver. You might find that somewhat outrageous, but it's true, he says. <laughs> he talks about it as feeling kind of hollow that when you come present, there's a hollowness because there's no I and other. There's nowhere to go. There's no idea of progress. You just begin to come present and be here for life as it unfolds. And then, if one can begin to do that, as we were did here, just resting in the present moment, then you begin to discover the fourth mark. And the fourth mark he calls peace. The normal word for it in the typical Buddhist sort of lingo is nirvana. You've probably heard the idea of nirvana. Nirvana sounds pretty glorioso. Uh, it's supposed to be like heaven. But he just calls it peace. And this peace has nothing to do with pleasure. It's simply peace, non-aggression. Nothing takes place. We simply quiet down. And in doing so, things become very clear. We quiet down. We stop trying to go from here to there, make our lives into something better. We come present where we can really live our lives. And then he says this. We understand at last that it was our effort to express our individuality that led us into misery. Let's read that again. We understand at last that it was our effort to express our individuality that led us into misery. This thing of being me, I want to be me, I want to be a virtuous me, I want to be enlightened me, me, I want to be loved me, I want to be rich me, I want to be good me. And that's what leads us into misery. That thought about constant, how am I doing, how am I doing, how am I doing? And the act of meditation is all about giving that up, that thought, and just coming present, being here which is really floating into no man's land. No one owns this. When you are constantly thinking about me, 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 he characterizes this as ape instinct. You know, sort of, give me a banana. <laughs> I'm going to solidify myself. And he says, according to the Buddha, nobody is an ape but everyone possesses ultimate wakefulness. We have it in us. We can do it all the time. We sit here on our cushions and you go off into thought and you're thinking, how am I doing? Oh, what's going to be, what am I going to have for breakfast? And am I, am I loved? You know, am I going to be able to pay the rent tomorrow? And then the preceptor sitting in the chair says, okay, notice your thoughts. And suddenly you realize, oh, I was in a dream. I was thinking and you let them go and you come right back to this space of the present moment 
and you're here again for your life, present for your life. That's the wakefulness. It's always there waiting for us. That wakefulness is not an effort because when you rest here as we were doing, it's effortless. The only effort needed is to give up the struggle. When you do so, you have a pleasant surprise. You find that something gentle and as you find something gentle and quite delightful. You realize tarpa, which is the Tibetan word for liberation. Liberation from me. Me is the big enslaver. I. It's a, like a sack of woe we carry on our backs. So finally he concludes with um, a couple of lines actually from a chant that we do here sometimes once in a while for Dharmas of Gampopa. And the first line is you ask for blessings so that your mind may become one with the Dharma. And he says in order to become one with the Dharma you have to carry everything along as part of your journey. Everything. Everything from the moment when you wipe your ass on the toilet to as you kick that can walking down the street to putting your swiping your card as you get on the subway to putting that morsel of food in your mouth to putting your head on the pillow and going to sleep at night, all of it is the grist for the mill of awareness. Becoming aware, coming out of dream, coming back to your life, being mad at somebody, being hurt by somebody, feeling those emotions arise. You come out of the dream and you see it. Whatever thought is arising in your mind, see it. Come back, come back. That's the real bird song. come back. Come back out of the dream to awareness of whatever it is. And he says, anything that occurs, however small, is regarded as part of the path. Nothing at all is separate from the path. Whatever you do is dharma. And then he says this, and this is where it's, it gets interesting at the end. He says, put my glasses for this. The journey is delightful from that point of view. You are totally in the dharma rather than being a part-time dharma practitioner. That totality of being completely in the dharma provides tremendous joy because you are not kidding yourself. And <laughs> it's the joy of being able to relax and know that what you're relaxing into this present moment is actually real and the rest of it is dream. He says the main technique is the discipline of mindfulness, which is what we were doing, or shamatha, the practice of sitting and walking meditation. And then here's why posture, he says, is so important. He says, psychologically, you are simply trying to pay attention. That's what you do psychologically with your mind. The physical aspect is your posture. You hold your head and shoulders properly. You are just like a rock, a sitting rock. You're coming present. So finally, the purpose of Hinayana discipline is to attain cessation. Cessation of what? Cessation of struggle to become something else. When you feel completely at home, when you meditate, it is a marvelous experience. You will feel personally that you are there. You are absolutely there because you are able to liberate yourself from pettiness and wishful thinking and wishful thinking. Pettiness. Wow, so hard to do. Our habits are so strong. And then he says this, he says, practice should carry along with it a sense of delight. It is completely secular and not at all religious or pious. 
That's really important. When the gong strikes and you begin your meditation practice, notions of ought or ought not, should or shouldn't, notions of punishment, of being a good boy or a good girl, automatically begin to come up. You sit there and you think, I ought to do this, I ought to, I shouldn't have any thoughts. You know, I'm not a good practitioner. I'm not meditating long enough. My knee hurts. I'm not a good practitioner. And he says, you need to let go of such notions. You have to become completely ordinary and not associate what you are doing with religion. And then, this is fun. I'm going to read the whole paragraph here. As a practitioner, you could actually enjoy yourself. Sitting practice could be a festivity. How about that one? <laughs> you could enjoy being a decent, being decent, being the best of human beings. Although that is what you always hope for, usually you substitute that with drinking and eating, wearing good clothes, going to parties, or swimming and lying in the dirt. Now, lying in the dirt is what he used to call going to the beach. You know, he just, he thought it was the biggest waste of time. <laughs> you know, people are going to the beach to relax. You can relax right here, any moment. You know, but people need to go to the beach to relax. So he called that lying in the dirt. <laughs> you know, because you're lying in the sand. But with sitting practice, you could develop real festivity. You could feel that you are a human being who is able to do wonderful things just by being able to be as you are. That's what we do when we sit. We're just being whatever it is we are. And if thoughts come up, we, that's who we are. If emotions arise, we see them, and that's who we are. It is why the Buddha is referred to as sugata. That's, a, that's one of the epithets of the Buddha, sugata. It literally means, um, what's the word in Sanskrit? Uh, suga, su, su, yeah, sugata garba, but um, it, sukha. Suga, suga, thank you. Su, the suga, suga, sugata it means, gata means gone to, and suka, bliss or joy. And he translates that as, he who has gone joyfully on the path. That's what the Buddha, that's one of the names of the Buddha. He who has gone joyfully on the path. The Buddha is not referred to as, he who sat painfully, or he who had felt bad about himself. <laughs> This is great. <laughs> I mean, don't we do that? We sit painfully. We feel bad about him. I'm a shitty practitioner. I'm never going to get anywhere. Did the Buddha do that? He's not referred to as that. <laughs> He's not referred to as he who sat painfully or he who sat, felt bad about himself or he who managed to get through his pain and now has attained Buddhahood. He is referred to as joyful. The path is joyful. Being a human being, being yourself, being a member of the Sangha, the community of practitioners, is joyful. Enjoyment comes from the sense of things being truly what they are. I'm just reading this chapter practically because I, th I found it so eloquent. Sorry. That brings great joy, things being what they are. And it brings the greater joy of uncovering Buddha nature, your inherent capacity for awakening. He says, you begin to feel wholesome because you are one piece rather than divided into schizophrenic states of being. One piece means you're just right here. This is it. it concludes, includes everything. Rather than I am who I am now and who I want to be tomorrow if only I can get it right. You are just one piece, one being. And at the same time, you also begin to develop tremendous power and strength to help others, which is delightful and wonderful. Earlier in the chapter, he said that's all he thinks about, is how to help others. That is a true miracle. That's the end of that chapter. And the whole thing just depends on continually coming back seeing that you're dreaming, and when you see you're dreaming, you're not anymore. You let it go. It just goes by like scenery on the train, and you come back to this. And in coming back to this, we begin to discover egolessness, the fact that 
There is no I. There's just this constant arising of everything, this and that. That there's no need to practice self-aggrandizement. You can't hold on to anything anyhow. It's all slipping through our fingers like water. That's impermanence. And in doing that, we can let go of the suffering that comes from trying to hold on, hold on to things and solidify me, make me safe, sound, which never happens. So that's my talk or his talk. <laughs> and uh, we can have a discussion if you like. I really recommend going back and reading that chapter. I, that chapter is so profound. Mm -hmm. The bit about egolessness and what it's like to be egoless in this space of the present moment. That description is, uh, is worth gold. It's just beautiful. Freeing, liberating. Um, it was very interesting, your talk, and I uh, have uh, one question about um, giving up uh, on becoming a better one, giving uh, up on uh, on something, on, on, the, on your dreams, on your goals, on whatever you want in your life, and just... Um, Keep yourself aware of everything. Is there a risk of um, getting into ignorance or a, a, or a very passive state, or how how to avoid this and how to keep yourself in a right way and not to fall in into ignorance? That's good. Yeah, yeah. You could um, wind up. Um, sort of retreating into peace, some kind of peace. But what comes along with coming back into the present moment is appreciation of the world as it arises and passes away, and a constant curiosity and involvement about the world, and if, uh, the arising of compassion for the world, that uh, you know you're, you, all you want to do is to interact and to be of help to other people. And so there's plenty to do. The plenty of being involved. Usually when we're lost in our dreams about ourselves, it separates us. It, it keeps us separate from the world. And uh, we could walk down the street and there could be suffering all around us, but we don't even see it because we're so focused on our um, personal goals. But when you begin to come present, then the world speaks to you because it's available. You're here. You can, your mind is open to it. And you become much more responsive. And then there's plenty to do. You know, There might be all kinds of things to do to be of service and of use. And, um, and in doing it, you exercise your creativity and your love and your humanity and you could become a very creative, useful, helpful, uh, and loving person, and much freer. Yeah. That's great, actually. There is that danger of retreating um, into meditation as a kind of uh, escape into peace, peace you know, from suffering. But if you do it properly, do it on the street as you walk down the street. Do it in the subway. Do it everywhere. You know, the opening your mind to the present and being there, you know, for people. So that when you're here and somebody comes up and says hello, you say hello back. As opposed to being so lost in some anxious dream that you don't even hear your name being called. Which can happen, right? Yeah, involvement is... There was a thing that I didn't read. I'll just read it to you when he was talking about this. He was saying, just to this point,
See if I can find it. Yeah, here he is. He says, the journey is delightful from that point of view. Talking about coming present and being here for your life. You are totally in the Dharma rather than being a part-time Dharma practitioner because you practice awareness all the time. All the time. That totality of being completely in the Dharma provides tremendous joy because you are not kidding yourself. In whatever I do, now he's speaking about himself, I am at the service of others. I feel that my function, the reason for my existence, is to serve the Dharma and the Sangha, the community of people on the path. My reason, he says, my function, my reason for existence is to serve. Someone pass the mic to Rochelle. Um, well, once um, uh, Rinpoche was visiting New York for a while, and um, he was staying at, s at someone's house, and I was serving him breakfast, and he was reading the New York Times. And I asked him why he was reading the Times. And he said, to see how I can help. Isn't that something? Yeah. To see how I can help. Arnold. Right. This kind of counters um, the misconception that meditation is somehow a retreat into uh, navel-gazing, you know, just uh, uh, concentrating on, on oneself and one's issues and problems and concerns. Uh, I remember Judy Leaf urging us to, uh, to know what's going on, know what's going on in the world with the same goal, basically, not particularly stated explicitly, but, you know, be connected be connected. Connected, and we can't be connected if we're dreaming. Right. So it's about coming out of the dream. And the more we come into the present and give up that self-concern of self-aggrandizing, which is so painful and so nasty, really. I mean, it's all about me, 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 me. It's very selfish. And when we give that up, we become much more available to be helpful and responsive to the world. I always felt that uh, Jim Rinpoche was sort of a, a model for responsiveness. He just, all he wanted to do was be in conversation in one way or another with other people. Yes, uh, one one. About being responsive, um, I felt that uh, meditation has kind of... Um, made me more observant of the surrounding. So when I hear he said that to see what I can help, actually I felt that I'd, I'd have the feeling all the time. You know, like on the street, everywhere, if you just been observant, there's so, mu so much you can help. Uh, you know, the homeless people, you know. S um, for example, the other night I wasn't, I just passed by and then after, the heavy snow, and uh, there was this homeless sleeping in the snow, and he was drunk, and uh, the, and I gave him a pizza, and I shake him up, and I went back home. And when I uh, check my phone, I know within two hours, the temperature is going to drop to, you know, single digit with wind chill factor. So I just couldn't sit still. I sit there, and I was home in my uh, comfort, but I just had to, I ran out there, and I gave him my metro car. I, I wake him up first, 
And then I said, you, you must promise me you got to pack and go to the subway station, go inside the subway station. And y if you don't do that, you would not wake up in the morning. I tell him how serious that is, and, and he, he was drunk. So I just shake him, and I, I, I have to leave because three minutes, less than three minutes I talk to him, my, my whole body is already frozen. So I'm very much sure that he would not wake up in the morning if he kept on doing that. So, but I gave him my, my, my metro car, and I, he promised that he he's going to, to, to go to the subway station. So things like this shake me, you know, yeah. And then also the other day when I was eating, this guy, a perfect looking guy came in to the place I, I was eating and asked the owner to give him some sugar. So the owner gave him some sugar, so then he, so he wanted to get energy from the sugar. He just tried to eat, just eat the sugar. And then he was asking the owner, can I have some of the food? And the owner, being a business person, cannot promise him that. That owner what? He's a he, he owned the store, he cannot do that because they will keep on coming back, right? So, so I just asked what the owner, what does he want? And uh, he said that he wants some food. So I went there and I buy some food and just give it to him. The guy's almost in tears. And he said, miss, I cannot take your food, that's your food. And I tell him, no, I already ate, that's yours. And please go to a home shelter because you cannot stay on the street. He said, I've been on the street for three months, you know? So it's, there's so much we can do. I feel like practicing here, be meditative, and, and go inside yourself is really good. But then when you go inside yourself, there's so, so much space, and then make you see what's out there in everyday life, everywhere you go, you can really do, see what you can do, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. especially now, I mean, it's just, it's, it's Every day I go outside, I feel very, very shaken because I see so many people on the street, so many homeless people, hungry, young. They are no longer those who have psychological problem, that psychiatric released, or they have drug problem. These are the people who are normal people. They just don't have a job, and they, they, they couldn't find a job. They have no place to live, and they be on the street. Most of them are young, not old. And, and regular kids, you know. Yeah. yeah, well said. I recently um, heard someone say that in this country we don't have an anger problem, we have a contempt problem. And um, contempt, the definition of contempt is that we feel like someone is worthless, that they have no worth. And lots of times, I think, the practice of meditation, bringing us back into the present moment, is about giving up our preconceived notions or ideas of what someone's worth is. is. So when we see someone, we see them when this person who uh, was talking about contempt said he dialogues with the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama, he asked the Dalai Lama, well, what, how should I respond when someone treats me with contempt? And he said, respond with warm heartedness. So, and that's, you know, warm heartedness is bodhicitta. Warm heartedness is like the basis of, of practicing. Because why are we sitting? Why are we in the present moment? We're in the present moment so that we can be warm-hearted towards ourselves and others. So the first step is to be warm-hearted towards ourselves uh, and not judge ourselves for every little thing that we do. And then um, warm-heartedness towards others. So when you see someone who's struggling not to have contempt for them, that's huge because we're always judging everyone. We don't know what um, that person has gone through in that very moment. Forget about their whole life. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's a real wake-up call, especially when you, 
We live in a big city where there's so many people struggling. Indeed. <sighs> well, this might be an appropriate place to end, should we? Okay, so in this vein, let's dedicate the merit. Um, this is where we, we give away the merit for the sake of all sentient beings. Yeah, I think um, the message is that when we regain our sanity, the inspiration is to help others. Isn't that terrific? By this merit, may all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings achieve profound, brilliant glory. <laughs>